Yeah. Tweeted. Great, great tweeted. We'll hang out for a minute so that some people can show up. Uh huh. Uh huh. So yeah, it's been a good. It's been a good tech week. I'm happy. New phone. Surface is fixed. To show you this so thing. Far. I saw an Instagram post about how you thought you were over your head. Yeah. Is it one of those pressed fine. metal things? It's laser cut. Yeah. Tin or steel. Yeah. That's Optimus Prime's leg. Oh, that's what it is. I see. So you take these things. Has it cut your fingers to hell yet? Oh, yeah. It's awful. I had to buy a kit of like these tools. Yes, yeah, so I've got a bunch of those. Yeah. And then I had to buy one of these things because I'm blind. Yeah, so I got one of those, something like that. You, um, I'm surprised you don't have like thimbles on every finger or something, so you can, or like some. You gotta some feel thumbs. it though. They're it's it's so small. Like the, this is, this is how small it is. This is a piece of his leg. Like it's. Is it sharp at all? Oh yeah, it's extremely sharp. It's ra it's, it's I would say it's almost razor sharp. What? That's crazy. I'd be using tweezers for that stuff. Uh, well, that's my next plan. I went and got some tweezers too. Cool. Does All your right. thing show you how many people are watching right now? Uh, 38. Because I went back and retro. That's good. I went back and retroactively looked at the App Insights logs for last week's episode and the week before. Yeah. And we were like hundreds of visitors during There's that. There's about hour. 350 at the peak just last yeah. week. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's good. Yeah, we're getting um, a little bit more organized. And I think when we figure out a way to promote both this and the .NET Core side yes. at the same time in a unified place, I want to funnel everybody to one place. Yeah, and I think the, uh, what was I going to say, the, um, the numbers of, on the episodes on YouTube, the viewing numbers have like doubled as well. Like every oh, yeah? week getting, yeah. So most shows are getting like 5,000 views now. Oh. Rather than, originally it was like 2,000. So anyway, it's good. People are watching and get that. Yeah, they get some value. Scandalous. Yeah, we got to get this thing organized. We got lots of good stuff coming up. Cool. So um, there was a blog post that went out at the web yes. dev blog. So I'm going to go into Google with Bing for web dev. Yes. And I am over at the uh, blogs.msdn blah, 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 slash web dev. Yeah. And it's called an update on ASP.NET Core and .NET Core. I think people didn't quite understand when we renamed things from ASP.NET 5 to ASP Core, uh, ASP.NET Core, rather, uh, they thought it was going to happen instantly. Well, there was two things. I think we... It's funny, segues into what, from what we just said before. I think we just kind of assumed that everyone would watch the stand-up. And so when we came in here and announced last week that we were pulling back on the dates, um, we just assumed it would be fine. And then what would happen is, you know, people would stumble across the roadmap and say, TBD, TBD, what does that mean? And then we, people would point them at their stand-up and it's like, well, I shouldn't have to watch the stand-up, which is perfectly reasonable. And so from now on, when we make announcements like that, we'll endeavor to do a blog post first. Yep. And, or you publish the blog post, like, in this, in this forum, and then we'll talk about it here. So at least then everyone knows via the normal mechanisms um, rather than us just like doing it in here with that close, you know, three hundred. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think putting TBD in the in the roadmap was probably without some asterisk and a paragraph of explanation was probably awesome. Yeah. So again, like if we'd had the blog post, I probably would have put TBD and pointed to the blog post. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I should do that now. The blog post is live. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, actually. And John, can you bring the blog post up and we'll share your screen? Uh, maybe. Hi, John. John loves community. Hi. I do. I it's do, but... Uh, web dev blog. Yeah, I... So you know you can just go I to live.asp.net, and then there's a link to the blog on the top. Oh, yeah? Oh, well, maybe that's on get... Sorry, that's on get.asp.net. I haven't updated you the sure live. Scott? I've, got a, I've got a bunch of tabs open in confusion over here. I just I chatted it to you in about 15 different places. I'm, I know the post. I just sent it to you too. on Gchat. I sent it to you on Link, Skype, yeah. Google Hangouts, and Snapchat. Can you can you ICQ it to me? Yes, I will ICQ it to you, and then also Facebook Messenger. Hang on, I'll get my carry. <laughs> All right, just a second. It's a Fidonet node is now sending it to you. <laughs> Deep All space right. network transmission. Cool. I'm yeah. So yeah, so the point is. Uh, 
we're getting better at messaging, but we're not awesome yet. Yeah, and, I, and we talk, I talked about this probably too long last week about how everyone's transitioning to this super open way of doing things, and sometimes we trip over our own feet, and thank you for being patient with us. But we're getting better. Hopefully we're reacting to feedback and making changes that improve it as we go forward. Yep, cool. Um, John, I think something too to, to be, you know, like to be kind of fair to you, Damien, and the team is like this is not like a standard release. Like this is a huge transitional release going. <laughs> so many transitions are happening right now. Right? <laughs> this is that's true. And I mean, I've, I've had a number of customers or you know, random people on Twitter, which are our customers, um, have some slightly disparaging comments, which is fine. Um, about, well, you know, you broke me, or how am I supposed to invest in this platform now? And my my re response to that is sometimes, well, perhaps you shouldn't be using pre-release software. You know, mm -hmm. if you want, like, firm timelines and, like, good understanding of when things will change and when they won't, this probably isn't the train to be on right now. Um, like, Scott, you and I have talked about the steak analogy before. Like, this, we're still, this, this steak is not cooked. <laughs> Yep. Um, and even I, I know calling it RC was contentious in hindsight, uh, but you know let's be very frank and honest. Like this is not cooked, and so if you don't have a high tolerance for things changing, then you should wait until we RTM. Um, and more and more specifically, it is totally appropriate to continue to use AS, uh, ASP.NET 4.6. It's a yep. great framework, and everything works wonderfully. It's fully yep. supported, and there's Great, great features in web forms and MVC and web API yeah. and even possibly some new features in web forms coming. So hang in there. Like yeah. you don't need to go and jump to the 1.0. And for what it, for what it's worth, for every like for every bit of uh, comment like that that I've received, I've probably received 10 or more of people who are saying I've been running in production since beta 4 and I haven't had any issues whatsoever. I think it's wonderful and keep going. Yes, yeah, things break every now and then, but I update and I move ahead. So. We do. I mean, obviously, any big change like this is going to have that type of split. And again, I just will thank people for uh, being patient with us. But we're getting there. This will all be worth it once we get to the end, and we are setting up our base of the pyramid for the next you know, epoch. So, mm -hmm. all good. I mean, I, I think that's what I was trying to say earlier. Is like this is not some people are like, why? Are, this is a big transition going from thing one to thing two, and then the next release of, you know, like continual releases going forward. It's, it's like this isn't a problem we're solving at every ASP.NET release. This is a big jumping yeah. from, you know. It's I mean, generational. It's definitely you, could, you could perhaps draw an analogy by looking at the last Windows release and how they invented the insider preview concept. And, you know, they were very clear, like, you know, this is a big release. They're moving Windows to a continuous delivery model, and there was a bunch of you know heartache in it being an early adopter in that model as things broke from release to release. But you kind of knew what you were getting into. Um, so again, I acknowledge that maybe we shouldn't have called things RC, uh, but it's kind of some parallels there. And that this is a big change. We're changing how we build and deliver the software, and we're figuring this out as we go. But it's getting closer. We're getting closer to the end now. So. Cool. Uh, there you go. Uh, John, do you have some stuff to share? I don't. <laughs> I didn't know we were starting earlier, and I had car trouble today and all kinds of stuff. So, so we've nope. had a couple of nice blog posts the last week. Well, one that I know of. Someone wrote a really nice blog post about how their site got much faster when they updated from beta 8 to RC. Yeah, that's that Steve nice. Desmond. Yeah. Uh, so I can bring that up, hopefully. Steve Desmond, CA. Yeah, he had a really cool analysis. It's called Performance is Paramount. Yeah, and what was cool about this is, so you tricked me into it. I wasn't going to do these. Uh, <laughs> see, so first, he talks about like some um, optimization using database calls because he's not caching anything, right? right? So every page request is doing the database hit again and again. So he adds in static and memory cache, yep. and that was good, and that brings him down into the averaging, you know, 10, 20 millisecond response. Um, but then the framework upgrade puts him down in the, like, one millisecond response. Yeah, and just how much tighter it is, too. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. So it's more predictable. This is yeah. kind of, most of them are good, but some are over 50 milliseconds, right? And this is, like, one to three milliseconds, like, always. And then I, I thought it was cool. Then he circled back a bit, and he looked at what would have happened if he didn't do the static cache. Yes. And, 
and just did the the RC update. And actually, this surprised me. I didn't expect that this update would like I would have expected he'd have to do the database cache. No, I think what happened is beta eight looks. But if I was just going to look at those graphs and not look at any other data, even though like you know I work in this room, um, it looks <laughs> like beta eight had a memory leak. Ah. Uh, and so if okay. you scroll up. Yeah, see yeah. Graph, see that classic sawtooth pattern there? <laughs> yeah, that's memory The leak. inclined sawtooth, which yeah, means that clear. as you add more load, the as it actually says it, it's like the, the framework wasn't able to recover quick enough as the load continues to come in at the same rate. It's like mm-hmm. It would look like it was about to, like it tries to flatten out, and then a GC would happen, and then it would get all behind again. It would allocate too much memory, and then a GC would happen, and it would just, it's never able to recover because it's spending more time GCing then it can you know, serve. Uh, then, then it can actually spend that time you know, serving requests. And so, once we fix that problem, you scroll back down to the last graph. Yep. Not that one. The next one. That one. Now at least the trend is flat, right? Yep. Which is good. Mm-hmm. And then everything else on top of that is an optimization. So. So there was actually some discussion coming out about this too um, on the on the Twitter response. Ben Adams and he were talking about this about response caching and how and where that fits in with RC two. We don't or, have or a response we, caching yet, so we that got punted just due to time. So we set we set the headers. So we have a caching. The HTTP abstractions have caching APIs in sense that you can set cache headers. We don't have a response caching middleware. That you can put in the pipeline that will read those headers on the way out um, and do the you know, and on the way in of the subsequent requests and shortcut the pipeline um, appropriately. So obviously we have a memory cache API, we have the I distributed cache and the I memory cache, and we have implementations for those. So you can use those, which is what he was doing in this blog post, in that he was um, caching database calls, right? That's the typical memory cache thing. But full response caching. Um, we don't have yet. We also have fragment caching in that there's the cache tag helper. So you can cache portions of your page, but that typically won't help these things unless you're doing lazy evaluation and things like that. Um, but we will do response caching, and frankly, it's not, you could write your own response caching, like rudimentary response caching middleware right now. Um, we just haven't had the time to have that in scope for now. Okay. You know, one other one uh, just to to throw in here is, uh, and I wanted your input on this. Um, Scott Allen wrote this up about serving static yes. files, including node modules. Saw that today. Yep. Yeah. What's your thought on this? Does this look like the right way to do this? See, I, I, thought, I, I saw this, and I thought I didn't understand this. I thought that uh, I I've just always believed that we shouldn't be using the app server as the static file server. Like I think those days are over. So, um, so in that gonna, case, you use Gulp to copy it over. You do a Gulp task, and now Damien's going to call me a putz, though. Go ahead. Do whatever. <laughs> do whatever makes you happy. The the substance of this blog post is that this is how you configure our static file middleware to serve from a folder other than the default. That's what I took from this blog post. It's just ah. that he uses the node modules as an example because everyone has it in their ASP.NET app. And if you're using npm to restore client packages instead of Bower, which increasingly more customers are doing. And you don't want to do the whole copy crap from the node modules folder into the dub root folder, and you're perfectly happy doing this, then this will work just fine. This is how you expose your entire node modules folder. But the essence of this is this is how you serve a folder other than dub dub root. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting what you said. I mean, like the the place where Bower is at is a little I'm seeing more people like Angular 2 is is they're not publishing on Bower. A lot of people are just moving to just use NPM. So. Yep. Maybe. Yeah. So <laughs> we, yeah, we'll support all of it. So whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Use what you want. Yep. Yeah. That's that's so that's it. You're not tricking me out of any more community link things. Okay. John has abandoned the community. Is that what I'm going to call it's, it? It's not true. I actually I thought we were starting a, a little bit later, and I had this car fiasco today. Oh, I'm sorry. So. My kids. My kids have Lego class uh, this week, and they the time that I picked them up has changed. Ah, all right. Uh, that let's, is why. Uh, let's thank you some questions then. That's why the case. Okay. Uh, thanks for the super amazing forum. Question one. You're welcome. You are welcome. <laughs> question Fine. two. Uh, this is Ben Adams constantly complaining about the be part of the conversation link slash advert at the left. This yeah, is the we know. You want to get if you're li- if you're watching this, you're on YouTube. You want to get it live. You want to answer questions and ask questions or whatever. You got to click on this little ad, and it's basically the 
the split brain between YouTube and Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. At some point, I think it's fair to say we will get this working on Channel Nine yeah. and have a better streaming solution right now. So I mean, we've talked about it. The reality is there is no other platform as turnkey as Hangouts for this type of stuff. It just doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. we're going to have to write something and use Azure yeah. Media Services, but that's going to be six months from now. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, so many questions. I'm gonna go to the bottom. Did I miss the story of RC2? I hear RTM is being pushed back a bit. So yeah, that's Sean. Uh, watch last week's community stand-up, Sean, and read the blog post. That's just not helpful. Well, I mean, <laughs> we spoke for an hour about this last we week. We did so, speak for an hour. You know, that is a very valid point. So yes, the very short story is our big yes. focus is replatting on .NET CLI. That's turned out to be a little more complicated than we initially thought. In the F, in, in the spirit of making sure we ship a really good product, we have pulled back from the originally um, announced RC2 dates. We're yep. not clear enough yet as to when that will be. So the dates are marked as TBD, and we're reassessing it week by week. I hope within a few weeks we'll have some dates again, but we're not going to add dates until we're confident that we and you can rely on them. Well said, sir. All right. Uh, thanks for this great resource. Can anyone comment on Microsoft Light Switch HTML? Yeah, the latest I Light Switch, not the silver I don't one. know anything about Light Switch. I know that Beth Massey... Yeah. Beth Massey, M-A-S-S-I, used to know about Light Switch. You can ask her. I, we are not involved in that team, so I do not know, nor can I speak to it. All right. Um, are there any plans to allow input pass-through of JSON.NET's type handling setting that in MVC? So, don't know specifically. I do know that the MVC options that you could configure as part of adding MVC to the DI container in your configure services method... The JSON serializer settings hang off that, so you can set the JSON serializer settings up when you configure MVC in your app, and then MVC will use that JSON serializer setting thing. Um, beyond that, I don't know. We should just say that for all of these questions. Yeah, and again, if, if, I'm, if I apologize that I'm not giving you a great answer, log a specific issue on GitHub on that repo, and it'll get answered by the team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Christian, I keep saying Web API as a product mentioned. Um, as, a, as for example, ASP.NET Core includes Web API. Isn't the message that Web API is now MVC and Web API is a thing of the past? I think it is adding to the confusion. So the the challenge here is that we've got kind of one ASP.NET. It's one unit. It's one large encapsulated product with its own versioning. But then yeah. there's the historical context of there's MVC and Web API. Um, if you say that Web API and MVC are merged together, how do you reconcile those and refer to those? And Christian saying yeah. continuing to refer to Web API is confusing people. So, I mean, the thing that's working in our favor there is we really sucked at creating unique names. So we just, like, created product names that just were words that described what it was. Mm -hmm. So, like, MVC and Web API, which means we don't have any way of differentiating them. The reality is that ASP.NET Core has MVC features and it has Web API features, like AP, features for building web APIs. Right, like Rails um, has routing. Right, and exactly, and we have routing features as well. Um, so when we mean that, maybe we should just lowercase w, maybe that's how we should talk about it, I don't know, but I mean, this, there, unfortunately there's just some historical, like you said, a bit of a historical yeah. mess there, but what we mean is that ASP.NET Core includes these things by default now, um, as in, like, if you pull in the package. I think, <laughs> I think, one, I think for help. Christian and, and some people that are more deep into this, that yeah. care about, that, that Web API previously had some distinctions and followed yes. message, HTTP, and so he's saying that's a thing of the past, you know, maybe there. But I, I agree with what you're saying. It's all kind of just, like, they're features of ASP.NET. Yeah, they're, they're packages that you can choose to build in, and basically they all depend on ASP.NET Core. You know, they, mm -hmm. they depend on the core abstraction, the core app model, and then everything else at that point on, they're just things that put stuff in the services container and they're middleware. Or they're just raw libraries that you call into, right? Yep. That is that is the new world. Yep. yep. Uh, will we see, as in previous ASP.NET versions, where you can have IIS point to a directory and it just runs without having to set up any environment variables for deployment? Currently, I need to use DNX watch IIS guide on GitHub. So I kind of, the question is kind of like, what's the IIS deployment model for... 
for ASP.NET uh, Core? So uh, for post RC1, we're still talking through a bunch of that because there are some potential for us to make that even better than what we had at RC1 um, as part of our replat on top of the .NET uh, Core CLI. Um, ultimately, it should be as simple as you like going to Individual Studio and saying publish and pointing at your IIS server. Um, or if you're not using that pipeline, you can publish it from the command line, get an asset, like a bunch of files out, and copy that to your IS server, and then it just runs. Um, but the details and the nuts and bolts of that um, are still being determined. There is a guide right now that explains the whole HP platform handler stuff. That was really the big change for people. Um, but the actual, like, oh, but that's not going to change. Like, you're going to have the HP platform handler. It's going to call something. The question is, what is it called? Previously, it called the batch file, which pointed at dnx.exe. Now it's going to either call like .NET run or um, your exe that you compiled using the .NET CLI or something else. And that's what we're determining right now is what is that best app model to get all the nice features that we want when you push to a server, like you know, make it start up really fast. But, but like right now, if you have a foo.aspx, you just need a web.config and maybe even can get away with a really small one. That's because ASP.NET shipped in Windows. Right, so I'm just I'm just wondering, is there going to be some kind of X copy deploy where there's something that tells IIS that's all it needs to know? Or well, so to be fair, that was actually not the case before. You still had to configure an application in IIS. I, I understood, but from my perspective, you know, you go into IIS Manager, you say give a folder, create an application, you throw everything in the application, and then there's your root, and you you're off and running. Yeah, and that will be the case, assuming the server has the HP platform handler installed. Right, so you need right. to have that one thing. Right, but from and then, that point, then you can just copy stuff in, and, and all the config is in the web.config file in that folder. So, so then the trick is going to be to make sure that we get the web platform and handler installed as many places as possible. Yes. And if you don't have it installed, that the error message is clear enough that. Uh, you can, well, if you don't have it installed, then nothing will just run. Well, hopefully you'll get a yellow screen or a blue screen or whatever you'll the get a blue, screen You'll get an IS is. error, which is like this. I don't know what this config section means. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when will ASP.NET Hello World work with .NET Native? How's that coming along? Um, absolutely no idea. It's 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 beyond the scope of this 1.0 release. So if that wasn't clear, let me make it incredibly clear. .NET Native support for ASP.NET, even Hello World, is outside the scope of our current target for RTM. Well said. So okay. people are, should not be looking for, expecting, or counting on native and ASP.NET. We hacked together a demo for the MVP Summit, which you can watch it's on one of those ASP.NET Fall sessions. Uh, Fowler hacked together something uh, to prove that it could be done, but it didn't use Kestrel. It used some custom LibUV wrapper. Um, it, he had to hack a bunch of stuff because it didn't support interface dispatch at the time. Um, like it, it, is, it was total demoware, and the native stuff is on a completely different train or schedule to what we're shipping for .NET Core 1.0 and ASP.NET Core 1.0. All right. That makes sense. Good reminder to everybody. Yep. I'm about to start a personal project, simple web app. I want to use ASP.NET Core 1, but should I wait a little bit with the naming changes, or should I start now with RC1, Update 1? Uh, How long should they wait? It all depends. Like it all comes back to your tolerance. I mean, plenty of customers have been with us since beta three or beta four. I think the concern is the, the big rename. Sure. I mean, the big rename. Like, we're going to put a guide out, so there will be a guide this time, a document that walks you through what you have to change in your application if you're using RC one uh, to move to whatever the next release is going to be. Um, but you know, we run a bunch of properties on RC one, and we'll obviously update those to RC two. Um, all I can say is try it. Like, I, I wouldn't be scared of the change, right? I mean, especially if it's a personal yeah. project, I wouldn't be scared of the change. I would try now, and if if you like the experience in RC1, I think that would make it worthwhile. Yeah, you will need to do some work when RC2 comes out, but it's, it shouldn't be massive. You're not going to have to rewrite your app. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, speaking of rewriting your apps, yeah. uh, I am por porting a big enterprise app composed of multiple ASP.NET projects in virtual directories. Yep. We, are, we currently use IIS for local dev. Mm. Will we see support for port sharing and virtual directories in Kestrel or no. IIS Express no. tooling? You will never see support for port sharing because that's a feature of HTTP Sys, which Kestrel is not built on. It's built on the UV. That mm. is a unique feature of HTTP Sys. Um, virtual directories are kind of in that we support setting the base path, but that's not the same thing. It's just that what is the root path for all requests coming in. 
Um, so you can set that on Kestrel, but it's not the same as virtual directories. That's an IIS feature, again. Um, if you need those type of features, you should just use IIS um, for that. And you, can, you may or may not have to have multiple ASP.NET core applications running on different instances of Kestrel. Um, yeah. Mapped to IIS, which is running in VDOs for other things, right? Um, the other question regarding using full IIS during development in Visual Studio, that is still um, on the roadmap, but we don't have a firm commitment as to what release that will be in. So whether that will be in the RC2 tooling or the RTM tooling or after that, we're still not sure yet. Uh, frankly, we're still getting IS Express to work properly right now that we've replanted on .NET CLI. Once all that is golden, then we'll go back and ask the question about what we need to do to make IS work. Getting Sounds full like IS to work in VS is, is, it was always quirky, and we need to kind of rethink that model now with the new stuff. But that is something that's on the, like, uh, there's an awareness of the complexities oh, totally. of what they're describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, for example, I was just meeting with uh, uh, Saurabh, one of the PMs, and one of the things he's trying out at the moment is the concept of having a hierarchy of VDERs in IS and having those VDERs be marked as apps that all run different ASP.NET Core applications, right? But they're all in the same sort of hive. Um, that's something that should just work. So we're going to actually try those things out because it, you know, it is something that people do. I mean, for the port sharing thing, you could do, like, reverse proxy kind of stuff, but... The, or I don't, I'm not even sure. How would you go about? It all depends on what you're trying to achieve. Like right. ultimately, port sharing as it exists in HP Sys is specifically the ability to have more than one process mm -hmm. listen on the same port. And the way it right. does that is because HP Sys is in the kernel, so it can do all that registration by you pre-register the URL prefix that you want with the kernel, and it says, oh, you, this is slash foo on port 80. That goes to this process. This is slash bar on port 80. That goes to that process. Kestrel will not have that, right? But you can have one app, obviously, that can do that, and you can have yeah. something that sits there and listens on one port and then spins up other processes, just like Nginx does on Linux. You can totally do that. On Windows, that feature is in HP Sys. Cool. Uh, follow up to the question about uh, X copying uh, to IIS, or uh, the gentleman is, or the person is saying, uh, will you have to publish to get it to work? Like, is there a, Will there be ways to get to IIS without a, a Visual Studio published gesture? Yeah, I mean, th th there's nothing stopping you uh, from having, like, manually setting up IIS, like creating a VDA, marking it as an application, setting the location for that VDA to your .dub root folder, right. and then getting that set up and you know, making sure your web.config file is configured correctly such that you have a live full IIS instance running on your current copy, um, but with the .NET CLI, you need to build it every time because we, we're not building on launch anymore, right? It's, it's ahead of time build. Um, but yes, you, in theory, you can do that. No one here has tried that yet because, as I said, we're kind of not at that point yet. We're still back at this point. So. Cool. Um, we had saw that discussion about memory leaks earlier, and Mahar is asking, uh, is there any particular tools that we recommend for ASP.NET Core for chasing down memory leaks? So we use um, the JetBrains tools, .peak and .memory. They work just fine. Um, Visual Studio works really good. So the Visual Studio memory profiler is good for certain scenarios, and we find some of the third-party tools better for others. We use both, depending on what we're trying to ascertain. Um, on Linux, you with that, that, that story is still developing. There's a bunch of scripts and stuff the .NET team are building to help integrate with the tools that people use on Linux, like the perf tool. There's actually a tool called perf on Linux, so that's incredibly generic. It's even worse than the name we give out tools. Um, but that's a very commonly used tool for uh, diagnosing performance issues. Um, and you know, Mono has the ability to, to produce dump files with a bunch of annotations and stuff as well, so we're still exploring all of that. Um, but on Windows, most of the normal tools will work. Cool. Any update on the tf-ignore issue? Things in tf-ignore, dot tf-ignore, still are being shown in Solution Explorer. No. No, I don't have any new data on that. ASP.NET tooling issue, that's issue 18. There you go. And it looks like it was open in March of 2015. Okay. Uh, so it looks like Sead is on that, and we'll poke okay. him after this. Uh, sure. After this talk. Yep. Do, 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 do. Um, I want to run ASP.NET as a desktop app. As the current user, not as a service. There's hmm. some part of my app I need to run the current user context. Mm -hmm. Isn't that just running self-hosted? That's what we are. That's what ASP.NET Core is. Yeah. 
So, so it is it is running as part of the current user, and uh, you should be. Giovanni's asking that question. It should just work fine. You can host it. You well, can bootstrap it yourself. Well, he says easier cross-platform GUI. As soon as you throw the word GUI, I in, assume that what they're saying is I'm imagining like an Electron app. Sure. Mm -hmm. With a local backed ASP.NET self-hosted web app. That's what I'm assuming. Might be a big okay. assumption. Yeah, well, so to, to run as a service, we actually have a separate host for running as a service on Windows. Um, so that's a whole different thing. The normal hosting model is you're just a console app. You just run, and you run as whoever launched you. So that is the default now for ASP.NET Core. Cool. Um, should you use configure await false in ASP.NET Core? Um, the, gener the general answer is no, is my understanding, and I'll, Fowler is on the line here, so he'll tell me if I'm wrong. Um, configure await false was generally for use in environments where you had a synchronization context, um, and you wanted to instruct the async state machine to not try and post the async continuation back through the synchronization context that was captured when the async task was first fired off. That was a lot of words. Um, mm -hmm. There is no synchronization context in ASP.NET Core. So you shouldn't need configure await false. But if you're writing a library that's intended to be called from not just ASP.NET Core, but maybe ASP.NET existing or WPF app, they do have synchronization contexts. And so you need to consider where the code is being consumed. But if it's just purely in ASP.NET Core, I believe the answer is no. OK. Here's an interesting and tough question. Uh, Robin is saying, I feel sometimes that you guys are living in a different world to me whether it be package restores, builds, or project loads, VS stops responding and crashes at least five times a day. Same at work and at home. Okay. That is, that is challenging. Like, it's no one likes to hear, it works here. But, mm -hmm. you know, as, as he or she is saying that, I've got this desktop, I've got this Surface. Uh, I haven't seen a VS crash in probably four months. The yeah, one thing I, I would say to was people with this... it crashed, it was an extension. I always, yeah, it's it's almost, it's very often extensions, and I recommend people, you can start up Visual Studio in safe mode and run it for a day and see if you get a bunch of crashes. Hmm. I mean, uh, because it's just it's very often the case when I when I drill into this with people, extensions hmm. all the time. It can also be environmental, so, like, unfortunately, sometimes the easiest way to debug these things is to use a completely different machine. This individual um, saying they, same at work and home. Presumably, yeah. they're different machines. Right. Mm -hmm. So if it's the same as work, I mean, I, I'm not going to say I, it's been perfect. I've had plenty of scenarios where ASP.NET, you know, previous ASP.NET five projects uh, were causing me lots of issues. Like the tooling is not perfect. That's why we're not finished yet. Um, so I don't want to say it's perfect. And I don't sit in Visual Studio eight hours a day anymore. It's been a long time since I did that. I generally like when I built live ASP.NET, I was spending three or four hours a day in it. Um, but I'm not spending long periods of time in there. But everyone in the here is, right? Um, so I haven't heard of really bad problems, but it, yeah. So certainly try extensions. Well, and I'll and, chase that down, Robin. If yes. you want to email me, and we'll talk logs, we'll talk extensions. Yes. I will say, without particularly calling out any particular brand, uh, brands or companies, but extensions break stuff. When Chrome yes. crashes, mm -hmm. it's usually yes. extensions. When Visual Studio crashes, it's very often extension. Yes. A uh, very quick way you can figure that out. If it's happening regularly, start a second instance of Visual Studio and attach the debugger to devemp.exe in the first one and right. set it up to break on all exceptions. Well, maybe not all exceptions. Not all exceptions. All the time. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly when uh, try and set it up such that you can capture a, a stack trace or a dump file when devemp.exe crashes. If you don't want to use another instance, you can use the sysinternals tool. There's a, there's, a, there's a dump capturing tool from sysinternals that will let you, you can run in your sysTray. And it will register itself as the Windows just in time debugger. And so when devm.exe crashes, it'll capture a dump for you. And mm -hmm. that dump is critical when reporting the issue to us so that we can then determine what was the exception, uh, where was the stack on what thread that threw, right, on the main thread. Um, but you might be even able to drag that dump file into VS yourself and analyze that a little bit to figure out what those what the stack was. If we can get a stack, then we can usually narrow down what the problem is. Right. Looks like we have about five minutes before I get to okay. get my kids. Uh, so you're going to have to be very crisp, Damien. You're, you're so eloquent and mellifluous in your speaking. Uh, people people have been saying that uh, you're the smartest one on the call, which makes me want to not be here. 
Where have they been seeing that? I haven't seen that. There's a private <laughs> Never Win But Damon uh, room that we talked about. Yeah. The No Damien's room? Nice. <laughs> the No Damo room. Uh, is there any O data in the new Web API? No. No, not yet. Uh, is VS Code working for you on Linux? Mine stopped working after the last update. And even if I reinstall Ubuntu and VS Code, it crashes at startup. Oh. That's fine on mine. Um, there's ping, Eric, code. ping Eric Gamma on Twitter. I would not ping Eric Gamma on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> is an important and famous individual we should not be bothering. He tweets uh, when they do updates. Ping me and I will ping Eric Gamma. <laughs> uh, uh, another, you know, also the, the code, at code, they do listen mm -hmm. on Twitter. But um, seriously, though, if you've got a good crash on, on startup, give us those dumps. I, don't, I think that Chris Dias and Eric Gamma do not want to hear that their thing is crashing on Ubuntu, and I know that a lot of people are using it with a lot of success. Mm -hmm. uh, what about code contracts on ASP.NET Core? No idea. Yeah, I don't that's, know either. That's my crisp answer. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, ask uh, a question on the home repo so that it's recorded and we can answer it for you. Yeah. But that is really, for now, the best place to ask questions. Everyone yep. is inside of, uh, everyone's in GitHub right now. Um, is, any, is, is the .NET platform standard being discussed actively somewhere? It looks like the standard platform.md document hasn't been updated in any month. So is that document is bad or not? That's because we're implementing it now. Ah, that makes total <laughs> sense. So if the spec hasn't been updated, very likely the code is being written. That's a yeah, great, that's like, great so point. now we are finding issues in implementation, but those are being logged as specific issues on the various repos, .NET, you know, CoreFX, CoreCLI, NuGet, et cetera, et cetera. Good point. So maybe not. Uh, maybe that markdown file is not the best. Excuse me, best place to look. Um, how do you catch global exceptions? Previously, you would have app domain, current domain, uh, unhandled exception, but yep. uh, the there isn't a, there isn't a place. There's actually an issue on CoreFX discussing that very thing right now. Awesome. So go and find that issue and, yep. and, and chime in. Yep. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, that keeps coming in. Well, .NET CLI supports VBC. Can I run an ASP.NET Core app using VB.NET? Not right now. Not right uh, now. One day. .NET CLI supports different languages because it just calls through to the Roslyn compiler. For example, they have s -sharp support right now, one way or another and VB will be no different. We haven't done the full end-to-end -end to make all that work, and it's probably out of scope for the initial 1.0, um, but we probably will do it at some point. Possible. Possible. I have been noticing both Visual Studio 2013 community and 2015 community running slow as molasses when debugging. CPU memory fine, but the HD containing the solution is being utterly thrashed, 90% for a minute or, or, or so. Ideas. This is uh, Leon Neal. This, this is honest... Honest truth, you guys, seriously. Let me tell you a few things about disk usage. A, if you're not running an SSD, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're running $60 on Newegg for a name for a Samsung SSD. I don't mean to be rude, but if you can hear your hard drive, you are going to be an unhappy individual in your life. Now, that doesn't mean something bad's not happening. Second thing, this is just me talking. I always go into Defender and or whatever stupid antivirus I'm running, and I exclude DevEnv. I exclude mm -hmm. MS Build. I exclude yes. the compilers. I exclude the folder that my code is in. Yes, you would not believe agree. how bad antiviruses while compiling can become, and it causes thrashing. Yep. Once you've done all that, exclude mm -hmm. your uh, exclude your code from virus scanning. Make sure you're on SSD. If you really need to, and you've got eight gigs of RAM, make a two gig uh, RAM disk. Compile on a RAM disk. Have you actually done that recently? I, I have actually. Done, I did it with C++. I don't usually do it with .NET code, but when I'm doing like a, mm -hmm. I'm building FFmpeg or something like that, then I'll do it. Okay. Um, but here's the here's the other thing, is um, run process monitor. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exclude everything except the five or six processes and see what the disk is doing. You know, Windows is not a black box. Sys that internals. from Sys, in, Sys internals, you mean? Why? Yeah, the internals. process monitor from Sys internals, and then you have to Cross exclude one. what's happening and go and see exactly what's happening to your disk. And uh, you'll inevitably find, like I found I was having a slow compile. It was crash plan trying to back mm -hmm. up my code. You know, there are also some Visual Studio features they may have enabled, like IntelliTrace or things. Or Not great. in community. Not in community. Oh, oh OK. Good Not call. in community. But still, an excellent point, though. There are features sometimes that could be causing you problems. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so many questions. Uh, in general, I want to use EF7, but I need to use EF6 because of 
one DB context because I needed to do some spatial queries. Mm. Spatial is cool. So the, there was something recently on the CF6 with ASP.NET Core. Um, yeah, so that's um, one thing to look at. The other thing, obviously, is to go to the ND Framework repository, ask an issue. If it hasn't already been asked about what the roadmap for spatial is on EF Core, and we'll get that addressed one way or the other. Yeah, there, one of the posts we featured last week was using EF6 with ASP.NET MVC Core, or <laughs> ASP.NET Core. So yeah, my, my, I think, my, the, the, as I understand it, the one issue that might be there right now is the spatial stuff that was in EF was very tied to SQL uh, Server, is my understanding, and the new EF is very provider agnostic. That mm -hmm. said, like, you add relational to, to MD Framework after you've added it like the core, so there's no reason they couldn't create a spatial but it's probably further down the roadmap if they're planning it, but it's best to ask the EF team. So reach out to Rowan on Twitter or ask a question on the repo. Cool. Um, how do we build ASP.NET Core apps from TFS build servers mm -hmm. that do not have access to the internet? You need to check in the packages. What's the best way to do that? I think that you take all the packages from NuGet.org and you put it locally, and that's your NuGet server, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like if, if wow. Um, On a build server that can't get to the internet, you would have, you have to, to set have up a local feed. You have to set up a local feed, whether it's just a folder that has all the packages in it that you maintain yeah. on a different machine. You, ultimately, you need to have those packages. Mm -hmm. Which is not so necessarily difficult. Like, those packages. Do a local build, and then you've got all those packages, and then put them in a folder, and then mm -hmm. point it. You know, <laughs> I mean, well, they, ship, they also ship with Visual Studio. It's just that they're squirreled sure. away in a magic folder deep in the Visual Studio hierarchy, but you can find them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And get them. I mean, so that, that that I've done that before on an airplane, right? You you go mm -hmm. and you do a restore, and then I grabbed all the ones that were in the cache. I've actually yep. had a blog post about this, and then I copied them to a folder called package cache locally, just in case. Yep. Not awesome, but I think we'll talk to the TFS folks to make sure that is a clean experience. It, it seems like a, that seems like there's a tool out there that would do the transitive closure, clo that copy it all, and cache it away. Maybe. Yeah, that has been talked about a few times, actually. Um, not a question, but I have noticed that people on Reddit and blogs are obsessed with native compilation in a single binary. Yes, they should be. It's cool. Yeah. I like it. It's cool. Lots of things are cool. It doesn't mean it's critical to our world, but it's cool. It's not critical to our world, but you know, I think Go got ex people excited about it not just because you can, you know, it's a cool language, but because hey, look, look this little executable I made. It's nice and clean. Oh, totally. I mean, I get it. It's very aesthetically pleasing, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, also from the point of view of why people like something like Docker, right? It's like it's one file. Everything is. Or, I mean, well, that's it's, a bad yeah. analogy. But it's it is one contain. Yeah. Yeah, I get you. Um, here's someone saying that we don't feel that EF7 is just not ready enough. Uh, or it's coming along nicely, EF7 is not ready enough. So, I mean, if you feel that it's not ready enough, then we need to have a conversation with, with Rowan, and it, you, have to be, you have to be very measured. If you yeah, have it depends on whether he means or she means, is it because of lack of features or performance right. issues or stability or whatever it might be, right? Right. Why? Is it, is it missing a feature that you need? It's like, oh, I can't go without spatial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, where there is a concentric circles of features, but you know, where the middle core is things that are required to build the other ones, and then the second, the second layer is the things that 80% of apps need. We're focusing on probably that one first, and unfortunately that means that features that you might need aren't there yet, but we'll get to them eventually. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. I like the startup class in ASP.NET Core. Uh, like configure services, but when creating a console app, it doesn't exist. Yeah, it would be nice to have consistency. That's because there is when you start, you're a console app, right? That's that's the very core model of a .NET application is you are a console app by default. ASP.NET starts when you call the web host builder API, and then you say build, and that runs your app, and then you call run on the thing that's returned from that. That that starts ASP.NET. ASP.NET is what understands DI. Like we chose in our web framework, in the ASP.NET Core framework, we chose for DI to be a fundamental thing. And startup is how you configure and boot your application, including doing things like DI. Those primitives don't exist at the console layer. Now it doesn't mean you can't use DI in a console app. It's just that you remember the distinction between a library and a framework. A framework calls you and you call the library. It's a really nice one. ASP.NET is a framework once you've called run. Like, we call the startup class because we have intrinsics that you rely on. 
Console apps don't have that. Console apps have static void main. Mm. And that's it. Everything after that is what you decide to put in the console app. So you can use those things, but you're not going to... The startup concept is an ASP.NET concept. It's not a console app concept. Cool. Uh, I'm going to have to call it. Yep. I've got about three or four more questions, but I have to go and drive away. That's fine. We can just call it here and say, ask again next week. That was 45 minutes. It's pretty good. Yeah. Hmm? We're doing all right. All right. Uh, cool. So, yes, it's lovely. It's the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up. Let's dramatic zoom with Damien right now. Okay. Zoom in. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. We need a theme song. So I don't dramatic zoom, but I do dramatic color intensity. I thought, like, your city had just suffered some terrible cataclysmic event. I thought you were just, I thought, I thought you just you were his, uh, VGA cable. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> everybody. All right, bye.